Good evening, counselors, and uh, thank you for attending our budget session tonight uh, to cover the fire department budget. Um, we'll get started here in just a minute. I uh, just so want to make sure everybody can hear me. Councilor Scamperly, Councilor Powers? Yes. Yes, sir. Councilor Kennedy? It appears she's kept away from Councilor Reach? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Give Nicole a second. Okay. Sure. Sorry, I had to go get my budget binder. Oh, it's okay. So uh, before we get started with the uh, line item review of the budget, uh, Jason Bouchard is here representing the Firefighters Union. So I'd like to give him uh, 10 or 15 minutes to address you all and answer any questions uh, that you may have. So Jason Bouchard. Thanks. Is it Jolly? A little handout here for oh, okay, Kathy as well. Two, three, four, five. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Manager Jelly, Mayor Skelly, Council. Hi, guys up there. Good evening. And once again, Good evening. I'm here in a truly unprecedented role. Not only am I being asked to discuss this budget as a union member rather than a department head, not only am I being asked to discuss the budget that I had no part in creating, not only am I being asked to discuss a budget which violates the oath I have taken along with that of 26 others, not only am I being asked to discuss a budget that throws citizen safety to the wind with no operational plans from city leaders, I'm also personally being asked to discuss a budget that does not fund my position within the department. On behalf of Local 1799, we are formally responding to your continued course of demands that we reopen our CBA. After a thorough analysis for the city's finances and of all the information the city has provided, we are rejecting that request. We have a binding collective bargaining agreement that sets terms and conditions of employment through 2025. This agreement was reached as part of the give and take of the Taylor Law process. I note, that union made serious concessions in the last agreement, including on minimum manning. Our financial expert takes serious issue with the current administration's process and their position on the city's finances. In summary, the city ended 2019 with a fund balance level in excess of the recommended levels. Sales tax revenues increased between 2020, or excuse me, 2014 and 2019 at a rate above the average annual rate of the price of inflation. Sales tax revenue estimate contained in the city's 2020 adopted budget will likely be conservative. While unrestricted state aid has remained flat since 2011, it is unknown whether there will be any reductions as a result of the pandemic or whether the federal or state government will offer significant aid to assist the city. The state comptroller most recent fiscal stress monitoring system score of 10.0 is low or favorable and gives the city a no designation classification. Finally, the impact of the pandemic on the city's financial health is truly unknown at this time. It certainly does not justify the cutting of any public safety positions. Our expert notes that the city has taken steps in recent years to improve the city's financial condition including budgeting more conservatively and adopting structurally balanced budgets. As a result, the city has had general fund operating surpluses in each of the last three years and the fund balance in the city's general fund as of 12-31-19 meets and or exceeds the levels recommended by the reporting agencies, the rating agencies, the Government Financial Officers Association and the State Controller's Office. Local 1799 recognizes that the city has expressed concern with its use of the state's constitutional tax limit. We understand that approaching full use of the constitutional tax limit would limit the city's ability to raise real property tax levy in the future. However, the fact of the matter is that the city's current 80% plus use of the tax limit was a result of a 2017 tax levy increase that restored financial stability to the city and allowed it to rebuild reserves to levels that now meet and or exceed 
recommended targets. Finally, Local 1799 finds it ridiculous that the idea that the city should somehow be concerned that the part of its tax levy used for debt payments and capital improvement costs is excluded from the tax limit calculation. Excluding these payments and costs is not a gimmick or, as suggested by certain officials, a stopgap measure meant to be temporary. Instead, it's part of the calculation set forth in the state constitution and applies to every city in the state and is meant to help cities make necessary capital improvements. Provided to the manager and council and has been emailed to all four of you guys, it's financial and contractual information. <clears throat> in regards to the financial, this will show that the proposed cuts to our department will actually cost the city conservatively over $200,000 more in the year 2021. That's conservative. Not to be understated is the fact that 10 families will lose health insurance while simultaneously depriving our city and its citizens of much needed, well-trained public safety workers during an unprecedented pandemic. Also included are the potential lost wages resulting from the census move. For a group so focused on the importance of sales tax generation, we are talking about nearly $620,000 next year taken from our own local economy. Losing good jobs is exactly why our community is continuously struggling. Look around. These jobs don't come back. The contractual portion of the information provided indicates the numerous portions of our collectively bargained agreement that would be violated by such thoughtless, drastic action. Contractual breaches that will result in unnecessary lawsuits, costing the city hundreds of thousands of dollars simply to reduce the services citizens receive. It appears the city's request to reopen the contract and its posturing in public has been for political reasons, not due to real financial concerns that could not be dealt with through the normal, normal budgetary and collective bargaining processes. The city should continue the good work that its predecessor started rather than engage in wasteful litigation against our union. We will not be reopening our contract at this time. Not only is it not my job as union president to even be here, it also seems trivial to discuss the need for our vital service in this group. This sadly also includes our chief, who along with council lacks not only the understanding of the responsibility for our responsibility to provide public safety to the citizens and their civic duty to honor binding collective, uh, collectively bargained agreements and whose plans seem that they want our department is for our department, excuse me, is eradication and decimation. According to Article 12 of the Augsburg City Charter, the powers and duties of the fire chief include presentation of the budget of his department. Please reference the information that has been given in our departmental history of good faith negotiation with the city. I hereby waive my so-called opportunity to take questions from council members and I will excuse myself. Stay safe, Augsburg. We appreciate your continued support. I thank you all. Thank you, Jason. Have a good night, gentlemen. I Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Okay, uh, starting on page D9, we've got D9 and D10. I'll everybody get to those and uh, I'll answer the questions as you have them. Questions on D9. Questions on D9 from anybody? Yes. So losing 10 people, what's the plan? What's the plan on staffing? How many firemen per shift? How many firemen does it take to, to put out a fire? And what if firemen are already at EMT calls? So the, the plan with 18 people will be to have four uh, assigned to each shift. Uh, we will have uh, somebody assigned administratively working training, uh, assisting the fire chief with, uh, with with duties. And then the other, the last position is the fire chief. So largely we're talking about 17 bargaining unit positions. 
the plan for EMT calls is uh, very simple the way we do uh, business now. If we have more calls at any given time than uh, we can handle, we will be calling for mutual aid. Uh, I've been working with each of the three uh, close proximity mutual aid organizations, Lisbon, Morristown, and Hewilton, to establish and uh, reestablish our mutual aid agreements. We've done that for response from the city to those communities. And the next couple, couple days, I'll have uh, our request for mutual aid to the city to each of those three entities. So, you know, how many people would take to put out a fire? Well, it's a question that's been debated for, for a long time. Uh, there's some, a couple documents out there that we follow. Uh, OSHA has the two in, two out rule, as we like to uh, call it, which provides for ensuring that we have two people outside in a standby mode for every, for two people that are inside operating. Uh, this does not apply to an extreme rescue situation where life uh, may, may be at risk. <laughs> We also have the NFPA standard 1710, which lays out the deployment for career fire departments that talks to having somewhere between 12 and 15 people assembled at an emergency scene, uh, something we, we don't and can't comply with today. So, uh, so we'll be using the mutual aid uh, to, to meet that requirement. So that, that is ultimately our plan for staffing. Um, I would like to have worked uh, a little more constructive plan with the IFF. I think tonight they made clear uh, their, their position in public, which has been their position since my arrival here. Uh, they're not interested in talking about any other solution other than the one uh, that was negotiated last November that is uh, not in the fiscal interest of the city, cannot be supported, um, and, and quite frankly, just, just should never have been allowed to, to continue. Steve, I, I, can you hear me? Um, you, you mentioned two in, two out, four on a shift, with two as backup. Where, 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 where are these alleged backup? You, are you are you counting the backups as shared services? So two in, two out is, is actual individuals. So if we have four people on a fire apparatus and two have to make entry, there'll be two people on the outside standing by that will meet the requirement. It's only a requirement in situations that there's not an immediate threat to life. So if somebody's life is in danger, uh, we will most likely send the entire crew to, to make a rescue. Uh, or with the officer on the scene, we'll make the decision to to wait for backup. Um, this is a well, firefighting is, well, is not a business that comes with no risk. There's no such thing as a risk-free plan. I don't care if we fund 100 firefighters. Firefighting is a risky business. Um, this has never been an issue of, of uh, not believing that we need more firefighters than we have, more firefighters than we want to keep. It's an issue now of what, what can this city afford. My, my, well, I appreciate all that information and I, I get that. But my question is, if you've got two in, two out, you've got two in the dwelling, you have two outside. Obviously, they're not just standing around uh, waiting for a potential call. They have responsibilities and, and uh, as far as the truck and the hookups and water yeah. access to, uh, to, to this area. And you said that you would have two as a backup. So you've got four on a shift that get called to a fire. God forbid yep. anything else would happen after the fact elsewhere right. in the city. And where 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 are we getting these other two that, that you're suggesting is standby? Right. Well, the same place we're getting from now, Councilor, the, the current minimum standing staffing is five. So the, the one additional person you're talking about doesn't provide them that greater level of support. The person operating the pump or the person running the scene from outside has to be ready to go, be fully packed up, and, and be ready to make entry if need be. It's a... Uh, it's, it's about the same process as we do now with uh, with a five person minimum man. <clears throat> tell me, tell us again about the twelve thousand dollars you have budgeted in here for the fire chief, and what the intent was in the original twelve thousand dollars you put in there. Uh, so again, as we've, we've discussed a couple of times, so what I'm doing there is uh, again being a proposed budget. Uh, we are we, we're we're building up to be able to fund the fire chief position when it happens. Uh, as we've been working through this now, um, we have we have moved the uh, enough money to the to the line there to be able to fill uh, that position when the time comes. So there, there was no original intent for that. Um, I don't, I, I've been asked this question several times. I don't know whether there was any original intent for it. Then why have it? Well, again, what I said a second ago is, I need to have a full salary in there at some point, or a half a year salary, whatever it is that we can we can get to to uh, to hire a fire chief. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then why when, don't we? Oh, go, go ahead. When will we have a fire chief? Are we actively like? Do we have what is what is the process? Where are we now, and what's an ETA on a fire chief? If um, 
this fire chief is coming from outside of the department. I mean, I don't think that that 12,000 is going to cover it. Where's the rest of that money coming from? So when, the, when you all get the, the final budget, uh, as we've, we've been able to work through uh, the other line for the budget, as you all know, we had significant money staged in contingency, and that's exactly what it was. It was places that we staged the money. So as we're working through this process, uh, places that we're making decisions to spend more money or places that you want to put it. So some of that money will get moved from there. To answer your question on the ETA of the fire chief, uh, I, don't, I don't have any good answer right now. The state is hoping to be able to give the test uh, in the spring, the same as they were last year. A date has not been scheduled. Um, we, are, we offered uh, the fire chief's position to one of the current assistant chiefs uh, that has the full qualifications. Uh, he declined the position. Um, I am going to call for the current county civil service list, review that again, and make a decision if uh, any of the uh, candidates on that list uh, are are in line to be promoted uh, for that position, and I will report to council on that sometime this week. Steve, why don't we just uh, consider putting eighty thousand dollars in there, and like we, a agency, if we get that uh, fire chief, then it's there. And we will. I, I believe in the in the next uh, version, you'll get I think eighty four is what we put in there. Okay. Right. Well, basically, what was uh, was budgeted the last full year it was uh, budgeted was S twenty nineteen. Yep. Okay. Um, have we made any type of offer? The FRB has an incentives available. Is that something we have we has that been approached? Have we they been declined? Where are we in that process? So yes, the FRB have been in contact with them about uh, about incentive uh, buyouts. Uh, they're open to it. Uh, we have to provide them a specific plan. I've asked the union on a number of occasions. I can't go to them with a with a magic plan or something that is based on anything other than solid facts. They take these things to their board to get approval. Um, however, uh, what we're going to do today after a discussion uh, with, with Senator Ritchie, one of the, the positive things that came from it is uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and, and make an offer. Uh, it'll be contingent, of course, upon the, uh, the state approving uh, the buyout plans and providing us the funds. Uh, but we are going to um, we're going to make a proposal to anybody uh, within the next uh, uh, six to 12 months that is eligible to retire now or will be eligible uh, that these buyout funds would, would be available to hopefully uh, curtail the number of actual layoffs that would have to take place to execute this budget plan. Have we have we uh, investigated any potential grant procedures, uh, you know, as far as anything uh, outside the lines of uh, equipment and turnout gear and, and whatnot for the fire department is, is related to uh, to staffing? So as, as far as equipment goes, uh, I've asked the fire department to prepare a list of the uh, equipment that they'll need for the next budget cycle. Uh, perhaps if there's, we budgeted some money now for immediate needs, but for the most part, our equipment cash uh, is in good shape. Uh, as far as uh, personnel goes, no. Uh, the, the only grants that are available now are largely are grants that go towards the stimulating of, of new positions. So the grant money funds the positions to get them going. The community's got to have a plan to continue that funding after year three or four or five. It's a phase out uh, plan. So until we establish what the uh, what the level of staffing in the organization is going to be, it doesn't make any sense to apply for those things. And we're certainly not going to apply for a grant to take the federal government's money up front with no clear cut ability to be able to continue uh, that that funding. I have a question. All the, so all the equipment in the firehouse is all up to date. Defibrillators, um, turnout gears, everything, uh, everything there is up to date. Vehicle yeah, turnout, turnout gears up to date. Uh, the biggest equipment uh, need that we've got to uh, analyze carefully once we get uh, once we get through this budget this year is the apparatus. Uh, our ladder truck is over 30 years old. Uh, the engines are all coming out 12, 15 years old. I mean, it's really time that we get a plan in place. These are trucks that are three quarters of a million to a million and a half dollars a copy to replace. So we've got some work to do there. Uh, we budgeted no money in previous years uh, for, for apparatus. Uh, the $50,000 grant that was received for uh, a small mini pumper apparatus, um, it was, again, a, a small amount of money compared to one of these larger trucks will cost. I don't think adding another small truck to our fleet uh, was prudent, so uh, we, we turned that, uh, that grant away. Uh, turnout gear, yes, is up to speed. All of our loose equipment is, is in good shape. Uh, we'll be expecting the delivery, I hope, next week of the uh, of the dual uh, 
the, the the King Cat pickup truck that replaces the old uh, dually that's in there now that we use to haul trailers. So I think the, the fire department facilities wise, uh, loose equipment wise, communication wise is in, is in good shape. Uh, we really do have to, to get a plan down soon for what uh, our apparatus fleet uh, is, is going to look like. And part of this uh, reduction, I think we'll be looking at a combination vehicle instead of a standalone ladder truck. We'll be looking at a little bit smaller version of a truck that can be used as a, as a everyday response engine apparatus and have ladder capability uh, as well. Uh, so we'll, we should end up with, with two large fire trucks, a combination ladder truck pumper and then a backup engine uh, for that. That's, that's where I see our, our fleet going. Defibrillators, are they outdated? I don't know the status of our automatic defibrillators. Again, these are different defibrillators, I think, than you may be talking about that were, uh, for the rescue squad. The rescue squads are much more complicated, advanced life supports uh, mechanism. If, in fact, they get upgraded, uh, we will have to look at our automatic uh, external defibrillators to ensure that they're compatible with them. But uh, that's, that's a, a pretty uh, small cost uh, comparatively. Are they outdated? Don't know. To the fire chief. More of my title is counselor. Have we looked at the staffing for adequate fire and emergency response, the SAFER grant uh, through FEMA? The whole point of that is established to keep positions that would be otherwise um, cut from budgets. Is this something that has been looked into? Yes, that's what we were talking about earlier. It is, it is also supposed to be seed money, though. It's not money just to keep. Uh, to fund positions indefinitely. It is supposed to be seed money that gets positions funded while the municipality figures out a way to fund them uh, in the ongoing uh, resolve. And we're not at, at a point now where we're uh, applying for the SAFER grant would be would be in our interest uh, because we've, we've got to get established our level of staffing and ensure what our level of funding is going to be. So to take that federal money to fund positions for a year to only to not be able to uh, continue with our own funding would be would, would not be responsible. I think it would be very responsible. <laughs> I mean, I, I tell you what, I don't feel safe with four men on a ship. Two in, two out, nobody operating. Incident commander, gone. Another question I have uh, for my fellow counselors now, we all took an oath here to uphold the Constitution, and that includes contracts. Uh, obviously, I can't vote for this budget and maintain my oath of office. Now, that means something to me. And uh, so how much do we think the legal fees are going to cost us, the overtime fees are going to cost us, uh, everything else, uh, the, the hazard pay, all this, all this stuff in the contract? Have we done an analysis on this? Is that what the $500,000 in contingency funds are for? Sounds like he was asking you all a question, not me. Uh, no, that's not, budget. The, that's not what the contingency funds are for. What are they what for? They're uh, to, you know, to put aside, and now they're, uh, I think they're basically all gone. They will be all gone for the most part. <laughs> where, where'd they go? Uh, so the, so uh, the, money that we're, the money we're proposing in this budget is gone now? The 500K? No, I think what I'm saying too is the money that we, we staged in contingency was, was money that we were leaving open. So as we work through this proposed budget process that uh, has been interactive with some counselors and not others, we can determine where we need to move money, where the priorities and where, where are places we want to put, put money into. So that the contingency line was the line we used to place that money. I think as we're moving forward now, we're down to a couple hundred thousand dollars in contingency money. Everything else has a, has a place. Um, we still have opportunity before the final budget to hear input from other counselors where they like to see money put. Um, we, we have a lot of priorities, uh, as, as you all, all well know, especially the three of you have been on council for longer than a year. You know we have we have lots of places, five hundred thousand dollars we could we could eat up in just a couple a couple pen strokes. So I, I'd encourage you to to reach out. I haven't heard from from any of you as far as where you'd like to see money spent or or money put in other places. This is I'd like a fire department. What about a bridge? what these budget hearings are for yeah it is yeah, what about a bridge yeah. need a bridge need some sewer pump station need a need some roofs i'm just i have my concern is is that 
in a conversation that Mr. Jelly had with a, you know, our outgoing um, someone that you would, that it was admitted that we did a good job negotiating contracts and that the fire contract that was negotiated last November was actually better than previous contracts. Is that a false statement that I was told or is that, was there, is there any truth to that conversation or was I being lied to or am I continually being lied to? I said, I just, I just don't see how it could have, it could have been terrible negotiating, but in a conversation you had with someone else, it was um, a better contract that had been negotiated in the past. And now we're being told that it's the worst contract that's ever been negotiated pretty much. So which is it? The worst. That question wasn't directed to you. Oh, okay. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, Councillor, I'm not really sure I'm going to be able to recall every conversation or even the conversation you're referring to. I, I would say I think I've been pretty consistent with this council uh, telling you that this contract was very bad for business for a couple of reasons. Number one is you gave false hope to 27 individuals that their jobs were safe for the next six years when you, Councillor, who sits on the Budget Committee, knows full well the financial trouble we were in, including darn near cooking the books with money that we never expected to commit. So I think the responsibility, if you want to throw some stones out here, you need to start to bear a little bit of it instead of grandstanding for people that you should have been honest with up front and told them that we couldn't afford this contract, along I've, with the other two that you signed. I've never lied. Uh, at the time, $1.3 million of assets that we never expected to claim for the Chiefs, but I think is pretty borderline. And to quote you, I, I can tell you something I heard from you, quote, we didn't want to reduce it too quick so that we wouldn't lose our credit rate. Again, those are all the right, and, and if you look at the last several two years that I've been on the audit committee, we have reduced over five hundred thousand dollars in bad debt. Yeah, you can't because keep in any the two debt years I have been on that committee. Yeah, you can't keep any debt that you don't expect to uh, recoup assets. You can't keep assets on the books. You can't do it gradually when you right, know you're I, not going to collect the money. You take it off. So if we want to recount conversations, counselor, we can. Otherwise, let's get down to business. Absolutely, and it was still in litigation when we went over that. No, and it now wasn't. it has since been since finalized. I'm not was criticizing never, the removal of the main box. Okay. Any more questions on the fire department budget? Yes. So, Come what on. are we anticipating legal costs to be? I'll counsel at this time that is the uh, privilege of information, attorney client privilege between me and my attorney, and I'm not going to disclose that right now. Not in public form. Can you disclose it in an email privately? Absolutely not. How about executive session? We, we could, uh, I will tell you that I am concerned about any information that I give up to the entire council that my attorney client privilege will be breached. I, I agree with Steve. I, I don't think it's. I understand. You're hitting all the buttons. I think the public deserves to have an and, answer. And so you're, you're concerned about. I, I, I wholly agree with that. So, with you're saying that you're being advised by your council. Is the city manager and the CEO of the city of Augensburg not to address the legislators who put you in this position and can remove you from that position? Well, and you're really we not willing to share right alleged monies that are being budgeted for potential lawsuits? Well, what's, I think we're I shouldn't say potential. Well, we're not. We're not, not potential we're, lawsuits because we're not there at a lawsuit yet. This 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 budget invites one. <laughs> no, Councilor, this budget invites the opportunity for city council and the administration to take back control of each of the departments in the city, the way we have control of every other department, with the exception of this one. If if, if I could have the floor, please. Yes. I think. Uh, well. Uh, first of all, let me just say I'm, I'm disappointed that the union's not willing to negotiate. Um, I, uh, you know, we're a community of 10,000 people that spends $3.4 million on a fire department. I, I'd almost be willing to say we're the only community in the United States of America with 10,000 people that spends that kind of money on a fire department. And I, you know, if you want to, you want to Google it, anybody else, and see if there's anybody else in the United States of America that spends that kind of money? I I haven't been able to find one. Maybe there is. Um, so I'm disappointed that they aren't willing to negotiate. 
you know, I said when I ran for council, our tax rate is through the roof and, uh, it, you know, it needs to come down. We're, we're struggling. We're trying to find ways to save money. And I, I, I just wish that the union, you know, had been willing to work with the city council and its residents to understand the situation that we're in and that things need to change and that we could have done this through um you know attrition uh rather than doing what we proposed to do you know and they they, they want to point out that they have a binding contract which which is true but it ignores the fact that you know you had a major election last year with sweeping uh four new people into office and that contract was adopted by a lame duck council which which i thought was egregious and it, it's an insult to everybody in this community and a slap in the face to everybody in this community so i mean i mean i i just uh i, I don't you know you do have a binding contract but you have to consider the way it was adopted, uh, uh, you know, at the end of 2019 after the voters had spoken and wanted change. Um, so I, I, I would just, uh, you know, I, I'm, it's too bad that, uh, you know, we couldn't work something out that, that would be done through attrition that reduces the numbers farther uh, to a level that, you know, we could live with uh, for 10,000 people for fire protection. Um, and I, Steve, for one, would like to thank you for being the, uh, the fire chief and saving us an awful lot of money last year and probably for six months or so of this year and everything that you're taking on. That's all I have yeah. to say. Thank you. I agree. So and why, issue. why don't we just stick to the contract that we have for starters and let four people retire through attrition? Because that's what the contract does. Not only that, but the FRB, uh, right in the report, says they will they will help the city of Augsburg with an a retirement incentive. And so, yeah. if you, we have four people that are willing to retire with an incentive, okay, uh, I mean that's a great start. Along with the healthcare concessions that were given and the hazard pay concessions that were given, uh, I, I just I, you guys you don't even want to try the contract we have in front of us. And you talk about attrition, it's all a bunch of hoopla nonsense. You know, uh, the error also, when those contracts were signed, that the council, nor the city manager, nor the city comptroller ever ran the numbers. Steve Jelly and Angela Gray ran the numbers, and that's when we first found out how much those raises cost in December. And without running the numbers, and you you truly did not realize, or you did and just ignored it, that we can't afford those raises. We can't pay that money. You can it's, more it's, than afford it with the health care concessions. Oh. How Matter of fact, the health care concessions is paid for the first for the for the whole six year contract already in the first two years. Oh. Where are the numbers? They're they're fictitious numbers, Dan. They're oh. they're not like you you see them here. Where Maybe what are they? Are fictitious? They're, they're numbers that Sarah told you, just like with our fund balances. That those numbers. Okay, let's go with nineteen. Let's sprinkle pixie dust on that too. <laughs> hey. Hey, Councilor Scamperly, did you did you say there's four people willing to retire? Is that what you said, or I said that in the contract, the contract calls for four to retire four. through attrition, and I would okay. suspect that given the option, uh, the I I suspect there there would be four that would be ready to retire if if that would be the way that we wanted to go instead of this proposal. So. It would be my proposal to offer a $20,000 buyout to anybody uh, as an early retirement uh, or retirement incentive. I don't know if it's not necessarily early because nobody here is retiring before their eligibility date. This is incentive to retire once you have reached your eligibility date. So what, what I will propose and we will send to the union will be uh, an offer for someone 
to receive a $20,000 incentive buyout uh, to be able to go. So I hope that once we give them uh, a number, I don't know if that's really what they were waiting for, uh, that we will be able to get some some action. Again, I need uh, I need a lot of specific information to be able to send this off to get our reimbursement. And I'm not certain that the city uh, wouldn't want to look at funding part of this either. I mean, this would probably be a good a good deal for us either way to, to reach our goal. But again, this is back to you know having some discussion and some negotiation. Uh, we can we can all go back and forth all day long about uh, the contract last year, valid, not valid. We're trying to deal with the situation that is in front of us right now. So, so getting some people retired uh, is 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 you know is, is the best way for this to go. So nobody uh, has to lose a job unnecessarily. That sounds like a good good start. So, so right now, so one already retired since then. So that brings us down to twenty-seven. So we need three more, not four, because the, the the contract lists at twenty-four. Correct. Well, that's 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 the catch. The twenty-four takes away your right as a municipality to control your own budget. And and I, I don't understand why that clause is in there. I I, I don't think anybody responsible or any planner, or I don't even think there's a judge in New York State that would would, would uphold that. Um, you you can't control a municipality's ability. Um, to run their finances, it's it's that simple, and I I don't you know I, I don't. So get is it. that the goal? Is that the, is that the the goal? Is the only goal here not public safety, but to reduce taxes? No, the goal is to be able to pay our bills beyond twenty twenty three, and be able to adequately provide public safety, which I think it would, and and maybe. Put some money into our failing infrastructure would be great. And address the long litany of capital improvement projects that have been in a book year after year after year that we are not doing anything about. We have a failing infrastructure in every way, shape, or form in the city of Ogdensburg, and we have to start addressing that. We also have to recognize that we have an annual rate that our budget is increasing all on its own every year. For my budget the other night, six position difference between 2019 and 2021 proposed budget, and we barely saved $65,000. Six positions gone, and we barely saved $65,000. That gives you some kind of an idea that the rate that our expenses are climbing. Again, you don't have to be a long-term mathematician or actuary to do the chart to see how long when that those expenses continue to rise and our revenues stay flat. And we have no reason to believe that our revenues are going to stay anything but flat. We may see a bump and a boost here and there from sales tax, but it's not going to be enough at the rate that our expenses are climbing. This is just numbers. What, what appears unfortunate to me the most here is that we, we all can't agree that we just have a numbers problem right now. We are spending consistently more than we're going to be taking in. I don't know why, I don't know why we can't reach some agreement on that and then how we get there. It's noble that everybody has come to the support of the fire department, but we've got two other large organizations that how we'll continue to do this is what we've continued to do. We'll keep cutting the police department or we'll keep cutting the DPW in, in order to balance the budget. That's what we've done previous. That's all we'll keep doing. So while we're supporting the fire department now, we're really sending the message to the DPW and the fire department when we've got to balance the books, we'll be, we'll be coming to take from your budget soon. I mean, that this is really all we're talking about. It's not like we've got a surplus of money we're sticking away and not spending. When I looked at the previous three years budget, uh, the expenditures were growing over a half a million dollars a year. And I don't see where we were hiring people for any of the departments. It's health insurance, benefits, it's just uh, the, the growth is un, uncontrollable on these expenses. If you take the 2018, 2019 actual from the previous budgets, because you can't 20 and 21, and what he's, what Mike just said, um, just as a point of reference, your uh, 
your retirement, um, Social Security, health insurance, in each one of those columns, it increased to approximately $200,000. And if you take raises and put them in there too, that's another forty five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. And that's one one area. Now you still have two other big entities in the, in the, in the city. Yeah, it's it's growing crazy. It's you you I, I really I don't know where we can pick up constantly. I don't know where 22, 21, 22, 23 year 24 is going to be because if your expenses are blowing away your revenues, I, I don't know where you where anybody thinks we're going to get this money. And and I I I don't want to see anything short, but there's not going to be the money to pay for it. And I, and I, that one, I, and I go back to that one section of the contract that um, uh, President Bouchard left on, you know, you cannot, during the life of the contract, the total complement or budgetary or budgeting unit employees shall not be reduced between the number of 28 and 24 due to budgetary reasons. I mean, <laughs> What if we don't have any money? How can you put something like that in? I, I, I mean, you don't have money. I, I've been going over these numbers and over them and over them, and I, I can't find where the light at the end of the tunnel is. And I, and I, and I feel bad at saying that to the general public, but it's, it's, it's catching us, and we were, we are not running as fast as we used to. No, if we could go back a decade and then do some uh, reasonable and uh, thoughtful changes, uh, we wouldn't be in this position. On page D10, are we on D10 yet? Yes. Travel. What's the travel expense, the additional travel expense? Uh, just anticipating uh, there wasn't there wasn't much uh, travel last year, so just anticipating travel for code enforcement training and travel for fire officer training. The increase in equipment maintenance, which is somewhat slight, but you know that's that's what brings me up to my question earlier about uh, equipment and updated uh, equipment. Yep, same thing, and it's just a slight increase to allow for uh, the same things we do, pump maintenance, uh, self-contained breathing apparatus maintenance, hose maintenance, any of those types of things. I, I added an additional amount in there to cover the, the minor maintenance things that we do. So you added 1,200 hours? Yes. That's, yeah, pretty small amount. I think it's a good idea to add some. Everything costs more every year. <laughs> I mean, all our firefighters are adequately trained, are they not? Uh, not, not all, because we don't. They didn't reach the requirements to be chief, so that they still needed courses. They may need to go to them. So I'm allowing for some money for that. Uh, we've also got uh, some hazmat training to do. Some, I want to bring in some specialized hazmat training uh, as we continue to. Um, you know, reinvigorate our, our hazardous material response team uh, uh, responsibilities with the with the county. And, and some of that fire, fire chief fire chief requires a a, a a high score on a civil service test. You know, they're, they're you already you know, our assistant no. chiefs are already somewhat trained and in, in, in the process of becoming one. Um, no, there's there's specific um, training that they have to be in order to uh, to be a fire chief in New York State. We've gone over this and over it, and I brought it up numerous times and, and broke it down. And I said that the, the previous manager in um, dropped the ball by not adequately training these guys to be able to take the test. It, we, we, we went over it and over it and over it. I'll, I'll bring it back in. But I think that I think that they got they they the city failed them on being able to get all the requirements because there's enough of them that could have taken it and, and could be chief. 
I'd also like to add to that, Councilor Powers, and that I don't, I don't believe that any of the four assistant fire chiefs want to be fire chief. Again, we offered it to to one that meets all the qualifications, and his comment was, you know, I've got six or seven years to retire. That's a long time to be chief, and, uh, and I, don't, I don't, I don't think I want to do the, the job that long. Um, and I, I don't, and I've talked to all of them. I mean, they all expressed, you know, that they they have no intention of wanting to be fire chief. Um, so. I think there's a, there's a responsibility there for the city to have been planning for for succession. So uh, we, we will be looking. Uh, prior, you know, prior to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Prior to January is when the requirements for police chief uh, training was changed in the state of New York, and I believe, and don't quote me, but I believe we had three candidates that were that were eligible off the civil service list to for the police chief. None of them just wanted it at the time. Or now, said, I don't know. Fire chief. You said police chief. Did you mean fire chief? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, fire chief. Thank you. It, it, it was my understanding that we were going to bring back um, Chief Farrell because he had to retire for one for one day and then be brought back because he was the only one that had the requirements. Because the training requirements changed in January of 2020. He didn't even meet the requirements. I'm pretty sure we have. Uh, this isn't old new. This isn't that we, we had three in the hopper off the old requirements. And now we now we have one, I believe. Or, I, you know, I don't even know, to be honest with you. But training requirements changed in January. Correct, Steve? The, the mandatory certification requirements uh, became effective in January. Yes. Thank you. However, just Mike, Mike, in fact, Mike Hummer. Farrell, I don't even believe had the requirements. Not, they're not requirements that are anything but New York State falling in line with the rest of the industry standard. It's not, right, it's not a right. training requirement that came out of the blue. It's not a training requirement that wasn't available to the state of New York. It's just the state finally came along and said, we're now making it mandatory because some places aren't doing it. So I, I just, this isn't something that was. That was thrown out that nobody saw coming. This this training has been been being offered for the better part of 20 years. The certification requirements uh, are are nothing new. So I I find that somewhat uh, of a of a convenient excuse to talk about it. It was a new requirement that was just thrust mm -hmm. us. The the fire officer three level of training in New York State is the senior officer fire chief level uh, certification. At the national level, there is a, actually a fire officer four level certification. So New York State. Has, has dropped it down a level, so it isn't such an onerous requirement on, on organizations uh, complying with it. So it's it's really not an argument that I think anybody should continue to wage. People should have should have taken advantage, and, and if you want to be the fire chief, you know, prepared yourself to to do such. So it's my understanding we have one of the assistant chiefs has uh, officer level officer three training right now, and then we have two assistant chiefs that have. Uh, uh, officer two with 60 college credits and I, I believe that qualifies all three of them to be fire chief correct and i offered the job to the one individual you're speaking of with fire officer three and he declined it um the other candidates who have the officer two and 60 hours of credits have verbalized to me on more than one occasion they're not interested in the job they like to remind me all the time that they have the certifications for it at the same time they're not interested in the job so I'm, again this is a this is a zero sum discussion we're having here is there any more questions on on d10 no, no, you've been dismissed. No, I have one uh, question. Sorry, I was muted. All things that you all could ask me, we could have a, we could have much better discussion if we weren't grandstanding in public. I would just like. Oh, never mind. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Steve. Great. That concludes our budget session. Thank you. How do I get out of here? <laughs>